The gospel this morning comes to us from the 15th chapter according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. And it reads like this. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice! with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. <laughs> Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning again. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A question for you, as I always like to open the sermons with questions. Today's question is, do we think we know better than God? Do you think that you know better than God? How many people remember Ann Landers? How many people are surprised that I know who Ann Landers is? <laughs> I love the internet. Well, I found an article from Land Ann Landers in from the Chicago Tribune in 1987, which was a reprint of a quote nostalgic gem that appeared in the Danbury, Connecticut News Times. Now you know I'm not making this up. And it's titled A Father. Age four years old. My daddy can do anything. Age seven years old. My daddy knows a lot. A whole lot. Age eight years old. My father doesn't quite know anything. <laughs> Age 12 years old. Oh, well, naturally, father doesn't know that either. Going somewhere, aren't we? Age 14 years old. Father? Hopelessly old-fashioned. 21 years old. Oh, that man is out of date. But what did you expect? 25 years old. He knows a little bit about it, but not much. 30 years old. Maybe I ought to find out how dad thinks, or what dad thinks about it. 35 years old. A little patience. Let's get dad's assessment before we make a decision. 50 years old. I wonder what dad would have thought about that. He was pretty smart. Sixty. Seventy. 
Why did I know you're absolutely asking me? Sixty-five. I would give anything if my dad were here so that I can talk about this with him. I really miss that man. The evolution of a father in the eyes of their child. It's like a cycle, isn't it? The evolution of the way we see our Father here on Earth is also like our evolution of how we see our Creator and our spiritual Father, especially for those of us that were raised in the church. I mean, Sunday school teaches us all about God, right? That's what our kids are doing right now. It teaches us that God knows a lot. That God knows it all, right? Teaches us that God is, that God does a lot for us, right? That God does everything for us. It teaches us that God is in control, amen, but God also lets us have our own will. This is what we were taught and are taught, and this is what we are to believe. I mean, it really is a childlike faith, isn't it? But like this article looking at our earthly fathers, we too develop this rejection, this spiritual rejection of recognizing God in our lives, of realizing that God is indeed knowing and knows it all, of casting God aside for being just too Old Testament, just too old-fashioned. We go through the wilderness before we come to the promised land, where we can see God once again, where we can believe in God's sovereignty over us. But hear this. Know this. God has been in control all along. God has been in the know of daily life, of your life, of your struggles, of your hopes, your hopes for the future, your realities of right now. What you're going through right now. Yet as we grow in wisdom and in years, we come to believe that we know better than God. And in our defiance of knowing better, of going our own way, we get lost. We drift and die. Like Jesus, after his baptism, we are thrown into the wilderness. The good news. The good news is that our God is a God for the lost. Our God is really good at finding lost things and lost people. Our God searches for us. Our God finds us wherever we are. And our God rejoices with us in being found. Just as our earthly fathers are supposed to do. But the difference between your father and the father is that you don't have to miss your spiritual father if he is gone. God is with you. Emmanuel, all the time. And you can speak with God and you can listen to God anytime you desire. In today's gospel, the Pharisees and the scribes, they thought they knew better than God. 
And all the tax collectors and the, quote, sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. Those who have ears, he said, listen. Now, the word sinners here, the word sinners here, it means a lot more than what we think it means to us now. Sinners, to the Pharisees, were basically everyone. Sinners were Gentiles. Sinners were those who were immoral or dishonorable, like tax collectors. And they, oh yeah, and then, and then there were those who did not conform to the Pharisees' interpretation of the Scriptures. If you did not agree with how they saw the Scriptures, you were a sinner. So that's quite a line for these Pharisees to draw in defining the word sin. Yet these Pharisees and scribes, they were what? They were grumbling, right? The text says. They were grumbling. Grumbling because Jesus was welcoming and eating with these sinners. Grumbling because he was showing hospitality to people who did not conform to the status quo. Because of what they looked like. Because of the country they came from. Because of the shame they carried. Because of the way they believed in God. And so they derided Jesus, as the story says. It says, this fellow, this man, this guy right here, receives sinners and eats with them. They were insulted by what Jesus was doing. Because he was lowering him to such a level. In their eyes. You know, this reminds me of another story in the Bible, right? In the Old Testament. Another story of people who like to grumble. The Israelites of the Exodus wandering in the wilderness searching for the promised land. They were good at grumbling too. In fact, they were so good at it, they grumbled through three, three chapters of Exodus. 15, 16, and 17. They said twice, what shall we drink, Moses? They said, we're dying out here of hunger, Moses. They're going to slaughter us all, Moses. Moses, Moses, Moses. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's pretty legitimate grumbling, though, right? I tend to get a little hangry when it's past my time to eat. When I haven't had my lunch after worship, I always like to have some water near me. How many of you have water in the car? Very good. I'm certainly all for not getting killed in a God-forsaken wilderness. So what's a little grumbling for, right? Well, you guys know me. We have to look at the word again. As it was originally said and written. Because this word grumbling in the Greek and in the Hebrew is more than just whining. It's more than just complaining about things. It's nothing short of a verbal indictment of the ways God has chosen to act. It's nothing short of declaring, we know better than you, God. God, why are you taking us through this wilderness? God, why are you welcoming and eating with sinners? God, you cannot do this. You're supposed to be, quote, clean, right? You're supposed to be religiously and politically and socially clean of sinners, of these people. But by the very act of them grumbling, these Pharisees are forced to put down their stones in front of God. We are forced to put our stones down in front of God. But like the prophet Samuel proclaiming to David, you are that man. We are that man. Through 
almost cost the kingdom. We are the sinners in our thoughts and our judgments of God's actions. What greater sin could there be than preventing God from coming down to be with our beloved neighbors, whom we have deemed as unclean, as sinner? We are that man. We are that sinner. We are lost. We are like lost sheep and like the lost coin of the stories told by Jesus today. However, like the sheep, we do nothing to the crowd. <clears throat> All the work of searching and finding comes to the shepherd, right? And all the sheep contribute to being found is getting lost in the first place. And that's how it is with God, isn't it? We are lost. Lost in our sin. Lost in our pride of telling God how it should be. This is how I want to live my life, God. And sometimes we don't even know that we're lost. And when we do, we can't even sign to find a way out of the hole that we dug ourselves into. Amen? Amen. I felt like that for nearly a decade as I wandered from bar to bar, to restaurant to restaurant, making money, living my life, living a very good life, I might say, but never living it completely. Because I'm broken. with no real way of figuring it out. Because this was the only way I knew. But what did I do? I gave up. I gave up. I gave up and I told God, you're in charge now, God. And God was like, actually, Lord, I've always been in charge. <laughs> Where have you been? And I was like, well, I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't, couldn't see that, God. And God said, like a grandma, well, that's because you have this sin on you. And let me clean it off. There we go. Good as new. Now off you go. Off you go is a single 28-year-old bartender who comes back to his home church. Off you go, meeting a girl, falling in love, getting married, selling your house. Why did I do that? Moving to South Carolina to go to seminary, have a child, come back to Florida for your residency, receive a call from the same church that you did your residency in, and plant a community with God and with you. You tell me who's running the show. It certainly ain't me. Amen. I'm just a servant. Martin Luther said that we have contributed to our, all we have contributed to our salvation is sin and rebellion. Isaiah tells us that all we like sheep have gone astray. He heard us, right? We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin, our sin of us all. It's all on Jesus, y'all. God has got this. Do not forget that today. And in the time to come. Hey, if you get the chance one day to take the whole day and read Psalm 119, because that's how long it'll take you to read the whole Psalm all day, you'll come to the end. I promise you. And at the end is a verse that says, I, after all that the psalmist has said, it says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek out your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. That's like a lighthouse beacon for us. When we're lost by these stories, we know that God is looking for us. 
but we can also help God find us. Find us better by turning back to what God has taught us. By turning back to the commandments. Where in the law we find Jesus, as Hebrew says, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. In the commandments, as you know, our sin is shown to us. That I don't have to tell you, but what you need to hear today is that Jesus is also shown in those commandments. And trust me, I don't like going through them like you do either. It's a strange after every one. But I also see Jesus in there because he's the one we cry out to to bear the burden that we cannot. He's already done it. And Paul sums it up well today in the first letter to Timothy, his protege, a pastor in his own right. He says, The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners, mm -hmm. of whom I am the foremost. I like that last part expression. This is God's mission. This is why God has sent his only son for us, the lost, to search for us, to find us, and to rejoice with us. When we confess that sin still has a hold of us, we're captive to it, God is there to forgive us. That's why we're here today. To forgive us in the word and in the meal, in the waters of baptism that still run over your head to this very day. These are signs of God's grace for us. That's why I love when you come every week. <laughs> it's like if you're sick, you need to go get well. You don't wait until you go and do it. You come. To say like Paul, I'm the foremost sinner, is to also say, God, you know God better than I do. Because God does. And I'm not sure of any other better way to say it. We said it this morning as we began our worship. We acknowledge our failure to love the world as Jesus does. God, you know better than we do. Better to love, better to steward this part. Better to do justice and kindness and peace. You, oh God, show us the path that leads to life. You are our refuge and our strength on this journey together. Or as the four-year-old said to him, Andrews, my daddy can't do anything. Hmm. My daddy can't do anything. Okay. It is that attitude that we take with us as we journey together in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.